Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Sujaya Srinivasan. I, um, I'm the genomics uh, technical lead worldwide for AWS Public Sector. And today I have, I'm very excited to co-present co with Dr. Snyder, who's the chair of the genetic de genetics department at Stanford University, and Dr. Amir Bahmani, the director of the Stanford Deep Data Research Center. And today we're going to talk about um, the precision medicine platform they built for education and research, which also leverages AWS Health Omics. Okay, so, um, you know, as far as agenda, I'm first gonna set the stage a bit uh, with, you know, a, what AWS is doing to enable precision medicine for healthcare and life sciences organizations like Stanford. Um, and then we'll talk a bit, uh, Dr. Snyder will set the stage for, you know, the big data in precision medicine, talk about a lot of the, the research that he and his lab do and the uh, discoveries they've made. Uh, Amir is gonna talk you know, about the platform they built, the Stanford, uh, Deep, uh, Stanford Data Ocean, and how they're using it in the context of both research and education, and do a technical deep dive into the AWS architecture, and then we'll, you know, kind of wrap it all up. So before we kind of get into the AWS services, I wanted to talk a bit about, you know, sort of precision medicine and uh, in the context of, of healthcare. So, if we talk, if we look at the whole uh, continuum of data and how data flows, the ideal situation is where this is a closed loop. So a patient that comes in to see a doctor today gets prescribed uh, the medication or the, uh, the therapy that's based on what's known today and based on his or her uh, diagnosis and, and their tests and all of that stuff. So that's how they get clinical care. Now, on the research side, a researcher is analyzing data to, uh, to discover new biomarkers. This gets fed into the R&D pipeline to develop new drugs. And this ther these therapies become the standard of care for tomorrow's patients. So ideally, the, the data, the information f uh, and knowledge flows from the research side to the clinical care and we want this loop to be closed through sort of the outcomes and the treatment outcomes of patients getting fed back into the research side as real world data. So this is what really empowers uh, the, the precision health continuum. This is the ideal situation, but that's not necessarily you know, how, where we are today for the most part. So today patients do walk around with thousands and thousands of data points that are collected throughout their health journey. Think about every time you go into a doctor's office. There's blood tests, they take blood pressure readings. We're all walking around with, um, with wearables like the Fitbit and the Apple Watch, which is also collecting a lot of health data. Not to speak of all the diagnostic tests and uh, genomic profiling, all kinds of other stuff that we're also collecting. So if you look at you know, all the to sort of the different data points that are collected. Um, and this is on the omics side, it could be genomics, transcriptomics, which are probably what is mostly being collected today, but in the future, it could be metabolomics, it could be epigenomics. There's a lot of different omics um, data points that can be collected about patients. And then there's, on the other side, there's also electronic health records, claims, uh, social determinants of health, your uh, diagnostic tests, uh, devices, in pathology, imaging, there's all these other data points, many of which, all, all, pretty much all of these uh, are unstructured. They're all in their own little silos, and they're not, they're in, not really interoperable or actionable by themselves. Ideally, what we want to do is kind of bring all of these data points together so that we can create this more holistic view of a patient to really power uh, precision medicine. And this is where um, the AWS has built these, uh, has created these purpose-built services for healthcare and life sciences. So over the last um, year or two, there's several of these services have been, um, you know, have been announced. Uh, AWS Health Omics for all the uh, omics data to store, so, uh, to securely store, query, and really get insights from the omics data. AWS Health Lake 
for the um, electronic health records and the health data in FHIR format to transform, transact on that type of uh, data and extract insights from even the unstructured part of it. Um, health imaging for the medical imaging data so that you can extract the metadata and store uh, you know, petabytes of medical images at scale. And lastly, AWS Health Scribe, which actually just went, uh, became generally available, I think, yesterday, uh, to auto-generate clinical notes from uh, the patient-clinician conversations. So these are all you know, the purpose-built services that really will enable us to get to that vision that, we just, uh, that I just talked about. So I want to spend a minute just talking about AWS Health Omics because that's actually part of uh, you know, the, the, the precision medicine platform that Amir will talk about later. So Health Omics really enables the, it has three main components. It enables the secure and cost-effective storage of the raw genomic data. And then the, it uh, enables like the, you know, the bioinformatics compute, managed compute, so that bioinformaticians can really focus on creating workflows and creating value and, and really focus on the things that they are good at so that the infrastructure and, and sort of the scaling of that is taken care of by AWS Health Omics. Um, and thirdly, the, the last piece, which is on the analytics side, today you can query genomic variants at scale with annotations. So, if you kind of add this to, you know, sort of the, the multimodal picture that we were talking about earlier. So you have uh, your clinical records, your omics data, and your imaging data. All of these, we really want to be, the, to, to kind of get to that holistic picture. We want to be able to view and query and analyze these through a single pane of glass. And these purpose-built services that I just talked about enable you to do that because they transform the data into a format that is then queryable through uh, you know, tools like Amazon Athena or SageMaker. Also, you can bring like third-party um, uh, analysis tools there to, to kind of build this picture. So with that, I'd like to um, in, uh, invite uh, Mike Snyder to come and talk about big data and precision medicine. Okay, great. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here and tell you how we are trying to partner with Amazon to transform healthcare. So we think the healthcare system is broken. First of all, it tends to be sick care rather than healthcare. And even when we do practice healthcare, if you think about it, the steps we do are pretty antiquated. Typically what you'll do is you get up, you get in a car or some other mode of transportation, always at an inconvenient time to go to a physician's office. When you arrive there, the office will look pretty much like it's looked for the last 40 years, a few new gizmos, but otherwise pretty much the same. While you're there, they'll stick a needle in, it usually hurts, pull out a lot of blood. From the time you're there and the, 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 all that blood, they actually don't make that many measurements. Some of them, I would argue, are questionable. Uh, and then lastly, from those measurements, they'll make decisions about your health based on population averages. And, um, Population averages can vary quite a bit. We want to transform all of these steps. And with regards to this last one, you've probably been told you since you're little, your temperature when you put a thermometer in your mouth is 98.6. But if you look at the data that are out there, it's more like 97.5 in this study, and this is one of several. They're all pretty much the same. There's a big one out of Stanford, 300,000 people, 97.7. But the more important point here is there's a spread. The bottom of that box is the 25th quartile, 94.6. The top is the 75th quartile, 99.1. So what that means in today's world, if your normal healthy baseline is 94.6, you visit a physician, they measure you at 98.6, they'll tell you healthy, you're normal, everything's fine, what are you doing here, go home. But I guarantee if you're at four degrees over your baseline, you are not normal and healthy. Something's off. And that's a big part of our work. Know what your healthy baseline is so you can detect disease when you shift from that baseline. So a number of years ago, uh, we started a personal omics profile. We're believers that your health, it is influenced by your DNA. About 16% of your lifespan is accounted for by your genetic composition. But the rest is actually due to environmental factors. You know, food you eat, exercise, intuitive we know, you can measure, uh, we know they all impact your health, and we can measure a lot of these, some well, some not so well, but you can measure their effects by doing these deep data profiles, and that's what we do on people. We do what we call personal omics profile. If you look at the box in the middle, we'll, see, we'll sequence their genome once so we know what their genetic risk is, and then we'll do many, many measurements, literally tens of thousands of measurements out of people's blood and urine, their 
microbiome, your poop will measure your microbiome, which is important for your health. Um, we do other metabolomics, lipidomics, all these different omics measurements. We'll measure, again, out of blood and urine. And then we do this on top of deep clinical tests, questionnaires. And then about 10 years ago, we got pretty heavily involved in the wearables back when they were just fitness trackers. And I'll talk about that quite a bit. And the idea is that we're taking very, very deep data pictures of people. And then we do this over time. We're actually sampling them when they're healthy uh, every three months. And then if an adverse event like a viral infection comes along, we'll take five to seven additional samplings. So you, may say, you might say, why are we doing all this? We're trying to understand what it means to be healthy, not what it means to be sick. How does it change over time? What happens at the earliest times of illness, like viral infections? And then, uh, you know, what's the difference between you and the person sitting next to you in your healthy profile? And then from the um, big data side of things, you know, can this, these kinds of new technologies be advantageous for better managing people's health? And I can tell you, when we started this, when we started genome sequencing, most physicians would tell you, uh, you should not be doing genome sequence. They actually got mad at us because they thought we would turn everybody into hypochondriacs, cost millions of dollars, and now the field's warming up, but some are there, some aren't. So uh, a lot of people aren't, and the wearable's still very controversial from physicians. So how many of you are physicians? A little bit hard to see here. Okay, not many. Well, that's probably good because I probably <laughs> insult them quite a bit. So anyway. So we do these deep data dives on people. We do it longitudinally. And just with regards to this last point, um, you know, what, can these advanced technologies be used to better manage people's health? The answer is yes. Just in the first three and a half years, I forgot to say it's a, it's a pilot study, but it's actually a pretty deep pilot study. We've been running this for 10 years now on 109 people. And 49 have had major health discoveries, and some were a pretty big deal. And it spanned a wide range of areas, hemocology, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease. You can see all the categories there. And if you look down deep inside, look in hemocology. You can see we caught some with early lymphoma. I should say these were all found pre-symptomatically. Nobody had symptoms yet. We're doing a, a very deep data picture, if you will, on folks. Uh, one person had early lymphoma, two of precancers. It's MGUS and smoldering myeloma or underneath that, they can convert to aggressive cancer. Two people with serious heart issues, one actually had a, um, a heart defect that was picked up by um, the genome sequencing, it suggested he was probably at high risk and he did follow-ups, and sure enough, he actually does have a heart defect. He's on medication now, fairly young guy. Another was picked up through wearables. So as I say, we're doing these deep data dives, and it was no one technology that did it. Sometimes it was imaging, sometimes it was molecular markers, sometimes it was genomics. Often it was a combination that said something's off. And again, all pre-symptomatically. So um, we think, again, it's like getting a much, much clearer picture of your health. If your health is a thousand piece big jigsaw puzzle, we're trying to get about five or 600 pieces versus say three that they measure today. So we can see a lot more that's going on. We're also, as I mentioned, trying to transform the way we do healthcare. So we're, we're big on this, and I said this even when I'm not on an Amazon conference, that we're trying to Amazonize healthcare. And that's the idea of actually measuring your health while you're at home. And so there are two aspects of this. One is wearables, and we'll talk about that in a second. And the other is this home microsampling, where you take little pricks of blood, mail it to us, and we'll measure thousands of analytes. And I know what that sounds like, but ours actually works. Okay, so what we do for the wearables, you may know there's thousands of devices out there now, uh, mostly in the form of smartwatches, rings, and, um, and, and they're actually powerful devices because they measure you 24-7, and they measure some pretty important things like resting heart rate, heart rate variability. These are good measures of your health, skin temperature, uh, blood oxygen, maybe not, not so accurate, but the change in blood oxygen is pretty easy to pick up with a wearable. Uh, I myself use about eight of these devices every day. One of my smartwatches broke, so I'm only down to three. But I have a ring. This hearing aid is a sensor, too. I use it for hearing, but I also measure my social interactions, and it measures physiology as well. So you can collect all kinds of data from these devices. Again, 24-7, they're very, very powerful. So one of the things we discovered early on is that you can tell when someone's getting an infectious disease from a simple smartwatch. And in this case, we stumbled into this by when I figured out I was getting Lyme disease or got Lyme disease of all things. Uh, I was in rural Massachusetts helping put up fences with my brother two weeks later, flying to Norway, and wouldn't you know it, my blood oxygen was abnormally low. It'll drop on an airplane anyway, but it dropped abnormally low and never came back to normal. When I landed, 
I saw my heart rate was up. Uh, again, abnormally so. I later learned my skin temperature was up. I didn't see that at the time. But it was all picked up, was all picked up pre-symptomatically by these physiological measurements. Okay, and then um, later, uh, um, I did get a fever off and on. I visited a doctor in Norway who wanted to give me penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline. It got a little tense, but he gave in and gave me my doxycycline, cleared it up right away. Uh, and you can see it's all, if you see where the plane is, that's when I first, my smartwatch first went off. And then, um, yeah, I, I got that fever. When I got back, I got tested as Lyme positive. It's a very well controlled experiment because I give a blood before I left as negative, so I see it converted during that time. So the point is I could tell pre-symptomatically when I got Lyme from a smartwatch and a pulse ox. So we went on, I won't show you the data for this, but we showed, we had two years of data and I had been ill four times. The Lyme time to viral infections, the fourth time I was asymptomatic, but I had a high blood marker called CRP that said I was ill. And every single time we could see my smartwatch jumped up, my resting heart rate jumped up in advance of symptoms. And we saw it on me, we saw it on other people in our group. Every single time you can pick this up. Very sensitive measure. So then along came COVID, as you probably know, March 2020 in the US. Uh, we, we had published that other work in 2017, Long Cane COVID. Um, we partnered with Amazon as a big part of this project, you'll see in a minute. Uh, we initially partnered with Fitbit and, and enrolled people to see whether we could tell whether people were getting COVID with a smartwatch. I forgot to ask, how many of you are wearing a smartwatch or a ring or something like that? Oh yeah, great crowd, most of you are, fantastic. So join our studies and there's the link at the bottom there. So uh, what we can do is we, we basically partnered with Fitbit. We wanted to see if we could pick up COVID. 5,300 people enrolled in the study. 32 had COVID. They had a diagnosis day and a symptom day while they were wearing their smartwatch. And so you can see this is our very first patient at the top. That's resting heart rate. You can see um, basically if you look where that red line is, their resting heart rate jumped up. Uh, they were diagnosed on the red day, red 47. Sorry, diagnosed on the the purple day, day 48, their symptoms were on day 47, but the resting heart rate jumped up nine and a half days prior to symptom onset, okay? So it's a very sensitive measure. They were probably running around spreading COVID because they had no idea it was pre-symptomatic. Um, and so uh, we went on the right algorithms at the bottom, Amir and Arash Alavi and others in the team built uh, uh, a real-time detection I'll tell you about in a minute that basically can uh, track your, your resting heart rate and other parameters in a circadian fashion and look for abnormal signals from that background. And it basically works, this uh, original detection we could show that we could detect when you're getting COVID, a median of four days prior to symptom onset. COVID has a long pre-symptomatic period, so it actually works pretty well for that. And temperature is terrible, by the way. Half people don't get fever when you get COVID, so it doesn't even make sense we're using temperature for this. But anyway, we do, but we shouldn't, okay? So uh, the, we did build this real-time detection system with Amazon's help. This is fantastic. And basically what it does, it tracks, as I say, your, your resting heart rate and other parameters, circadian fashion, and looks for this abnormal signal that's either too high or too long, combination of both. And you have to click on it, it gives you a red alert. Soon I hope you won't have to click on it. But here's our very first case, or one of our first cases here. Day 21 is when that person first had symptoms. Uh, 22 is when they're diagnosed, but they're getting red alerts for three days prior to symptom onset. It works for Fitbit, works for Apple, works in um, uh, pre-symptomatic, or sorry, asymptomatic cases as well. 80% of the time, same number. We, 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 don't, we don't, it's not perfect, that's why we need more data, that's why we need you to sign up. We wanna bring in other data types that'll make this much more sensitive. When uh, we think this is the tip of the iceberg, uh, detecting infectious disease. We think um, we should be able to spread this to the whole planet. That's the goal to do with Amazon. Half the planet you may know has a smartphone. If we pair it with a smartwatch, we could tell malnourished infectious disease for half the planet, which would be pretty cool. Uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg on the infectious disease. There are many other clinical markers you can pick up. We use machine learning for this to be able to see if we could tell things like red blood cell counts, things like that from a smartwatch. And if you think about it, it makes sense you should because your watch shines light into your blood, looks for spectroscopic shifts, and you can pick that up with a smartwatch. And so we can pick up all these clinical parameters. The left ones are rel relevant for anemia, red blood cell count, the middle hemoglobin A1C and glucose for uh, glucose monitoring and so on and so forth. So we're also doing a lot here with continuous glucose monitors. I won't have time to talk about that. You can ask Amir or bring it up in the questions. 
Uh, the other area that we're pushing very, very hard on is this idea of home microsampling. Why do you go to a doctor uh, when you're healthy or when you're sick if you, if you don't have to? Can you measure some of this at home, especially if you're healthy? Why would you want to go to a doctor and meet all these sick people and get you sick? So you'd be better off doing frequent monitoring at home, and we think this could be done. So we spent about six and a half now, about seven years on this, trying to optimize sampling systems that would keep the analytes, the, the markers, your molecules in your blood, very stable. We settled on two, the top one there, Mitra. There's also something called TASO devices that we use. Uh, you FedEx it to the lab, and we'll process this with our omics assays. And we measure about 2,200 analytes from uh, very small drops, 10 microliters of blood. Okay. And so uh, we showed that most of these analytes are stable, proteins, metabolites, lipids, some are, some aren't. Uh, but then we did really fun experiments. We had 32 people drink this Ensure shake. You can buy it in CVS, doesn't taste very good, uh, but nonetheless, people buy the stuff anyway. We sampled people at zero time point, you can see at the bottom, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, 240 minutes after drinking the shake. What happens is hundreds of molecules change. We can measure all this, including a lot of glucose control molecules like insulin, these GLP-1 agonists, or GLP-1, which are fa fancy molecules that people are making drugs around that are blockbusters. You may have heard of Zempic, stuff like that. So anyway, uh, but it turns out people, different, everybody responds to the shake differently. And the boxes at the top show just three examples of carbohydrates. Me remember, we're measuring thousands of molecules. And basically, if you look over there, each box is a different person. For some people, their carbs plummet after they drink the shake. For other people, their carbohydrates skyrocket after drinking the exact same shake. Okay, so there, and we can classify people into five categories, whether you go up or down, depending on your carbs, your amino acids, your various things. So we're all reacting differently to the exact same shake. And the cool result, it's probably hard to explain without a pointer, but if you look at that bottom kind of row, where it says the five groups, the gray is the average of, of folks. Uh, let me try this anyway, see if the pointer will work. All right, oh, it does, sorry, I should have brought this out earlier. See, that? that's the average of the 32 people in gray. These are the inflammatory markers in brown. In group five, the inflammatory markers go down when they drink the shake, but in group four, they go up. Group one, they go up too. Same shake, pro-inflammatory for some people, anti-inflammatory for others. 10% of people have inflammatory bowel syndrome. Most have no idea what's causing it. We could actually measure that and tell you in principle. So this, we think this is gonna be powerful for the future. And the same is true for other kinds of things people are eating. <laughs> we have all kinds of fiber studies. Uh, the other thing, this is the ultimate experiment where I see this whole field going, which is uh, deep monitoring on individual people. This is one person who sampled themselves every hour for seven straight days during waking hours and then did the microsampling. We did all the omics profiling. They were wearing a, a continuous glucose monitor to follow glucose levels, uh, a smartwatch to follow resting heart rate, all these other things, sleep as well, and do food logging. And not surprisingly, over 1,000 molecules changed during this period. And the cool thing is we can start seeing what kinds of things are correlating between people's behavior, their biochemistry, and their physiology. Okay, so we're seeing exactly what's going on with you with everything you do, essentially. Um, and what we find are thousands of associations between just some simple things like, um, let's try this. Uh, so we're, oh, we're doing time lag correlations uh, because the idea is upstream events may be causative of downstream ones, doesn't prove that, but we're, we're especially interested in upstream events. And here is, I believe, resting heart rate, glucose levels, and that steps. And so you can make correlations between these inflammatory markers, the cytokines, uh, metabolites uh, are in green and lipids are in blue. We find all kinds of cool associations. So for example, we get this association between glucose and insulin C peptide, that's not a surprise, but we can measure it in this person. It's a 10 minute shift. We can measure its magnitude. But then you find things we didn't know. We find new inflammatory markers that go up in response to glucose. And here's a cool one. Alpha-synuclein, which is evolved in dementia and Parkinson's, it turns out it has a very interesting pattern we think correlates with stress. So imagine you're, in, you're at high risk for dementia. Maybe you wanna know that. Maybe you wanna avoid those activities that trigger that stress. These are the kinds of things we think we can do. Set up personalized AI models around people with key markers and then try and modify people's behavior, just like we're trying to do with glucose control. 
So how do we get this out to the world? Well, I'm in Silicon Valley, you spin off companies. And so I founded 17 over the years. And uh, you know, they're like QBio does a medical version of what I just showed. I sh what I showed you is a research study, but they're doing a medical version of this and including whole body MRI, which is caught just like uh, we found. We found all kinds of very interesting, uh, like we caught some with early pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, things like this in advance of symptoms because we're doing deep data on people while they're healthy. Uh, smartwatch companies, here's one that's interesting. This, this is the metabolic testing, the thing I just told you that you mail in your samples will tell you the levels of 500 analytes, relative levels, uh, which is used for wellness profiling. Here's one that measures continuous glucose that actually, uh, again, gives you a whole behavior modification program around this. And lastly, if uh, this is relevant for long COVID, it has uh, some of the micro sampling and some other uh, base mechanism. So the bottom line is we think that these, these, plat these companies are measuring different kinds of health monitors. They can be very, very powerful for tracking people. And ultimately, of course, we're going to synthesize all this stuff together for precision health monitoring. We need a fancy database to handle this in our research lab. This is where Amir comes in. And Amir, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us about platform. We call it Stanford Data Ocean because it's bigger than a lake. It's got all kinds of data. Amir. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, all right. Um, following in science provided by uh, Sajaya and Dr. Snyder, I want to start my presentation with one example. Let's assume that you want to help me to move from point A to point Z, and you want to tell me which way is the quickest way. So, of course, you need to get access to these layers of information, right? Traffic, you know, wildfires, COVID-19 restrictions. Let's assume that we remove traffic layer, then what would happen, right? So your solution is going to be a guesstimate, right? Because you don't know. So when we're talking about human health, our health is a combination of three major factors. We're talking about gut bacteria, right? Microbiome, our uh, DNA, RNA, protein, our genes. And then we're talking about our, uh, you know, uh, environment, our uh, diet, our lifestyle. Combinations of these three factors create all the small molecules in our body. So if you are a physician, biologist, or a geneticist like Dr. Snyder, and you want to help someone to move from a disease state to a healthy state, then you, can, you need to get access to these layers of information, right? And every layer is going to help you to make a better and more accurate decision. So essentially what's happening here is that we're moving away from gas-based medicine to data-driven medicine. But as a result of that, when you start collecting data, then your cost function rapidly changes toward computation and storage. At Stanford, in our center, we collected over two petabytes of data around one individual. <laughs> so, um, you know, storing one petabyte of data on any major cloud provider, it would cost you something around, you know, on a standard storage, it costs you roughly $20,000 per month. So clearly, we need better computational and storage systems. So um, when we talk about deep data and deep medicine, we have at least four needs. The first one is around uh, data acquisition. So we, have, we, should, you know, we need solutions around data acquisition, data collection from different devices. Then we have another need around storage. We have different classes of storage, so we have to think about it. Data distribution is very important. Different continents, you know, different cities and uh, countries, so regulatory part is important. And then we get to the data analysis, which is AIML. But if you are a, a lab, a research lab or a startup company, you want to put up a solution around any of these needs, then you will deal with at least three major challenges. The first one is, of course, the scalability. Uh, for a long time, if you wanted to publish something in uh, precision medicine, probably you, need, you would have need you know, like something around like a handful of participants. But today, if you want to publish in high-profile journals, then you have to show that your algorithm works for a large number of participants, right? So that's the first one, scalability. The second piece is around interoperability. So your algorithm should work for different devices on different platforms. Uh, and uh, so that's going to impact, of course, the scalability, which is intertwined with you know, uh, scalability. So the third, and the third piece, which is uh, the foundation of any medical application, is around security and privacy. And as we are collecting deep data, it's going to be more and more important. So uh, we have to uh, take care of that. So uh, before I talk about uh, data ocean uh, and uh, the idea of data ocean, 
Uh, I want to tell you about you know, the type of applications that we are dealing with them in the School of Medicine. The first group, of course, are throughput-oriented applications. And it's like Dr. Snyder would tell me that, I mean, we have 1,000 genomes, and uh, you know, I want them to be processed in the next 30 days. So he doesn't care if I process half of them tomorrow and the rest of them in the next 29 days, right? So uh, as long as all of them are getting processed in the next 30 days, he's happy. So you could, of course, handle this kind of jobs to an extent if you have a proper hardware on your local cluster computer. But the other workload that is getting more and more uh, popular and important in the field of precision medicine is latency-sensitive applications. And what's happening here is that we are trying to have a user engagement, right? Constantly monitoring what's going on. For example, if I share my heart rate uh, you know, to a physician outside of this room, then probably they're gonna give me a red alert, right? <laughs> Not knowing that you know, I'm giving a talk. So essentially all these annotations are important. So we're trying to collect uh, well annotated data sets, right? Qu uh, quality data. We don't want junk data. So as a result of that, when you are dealing with patients and users, then this is uh, going to be a latency sensitive application and you need an elastic system, right? And who is good in elasticity? Of course, cloud computing. And Amazon is the pioneer, of course. In 2006, they introduced Elastic Compute Cloud. So uh, that's, you know, especially if you have a, a, a large-scale study running on multiple continents and multiple countries, then it's almost impossible, you know, to run it on a little cluster computer. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the story of Data Ocean. In 2020, as Dr. Snyder mentioned, we were the first team showing that with uh, heart rate using heart rate and variable data, we could detect COVID-19. And we published this paper in Nature Biomedical Engineering, and in the first uh, several months, the paper got access 100,000 times. And we got so many emails that people were asking about data availability and code, you know. And in this uh, Nature papers, at the bottom of them, there are two sections, data availability and code availability. And you, if you are interested, you have to go ahead and download these data sets. Of course, you may not have enough storage, to handle that. Uh, the second piece is around you know, configuring the code, installing all the libraries. But let's assume you have a container image. Still, you know, if it works for your CPU architecture, that would be great. You know, if not, then you have to recreate that. And the third piece is that whether you have the computing power, right? Computing framework. It's like GPUs, you may not even have those computing power. So we realize that this is a big problem, especially for underprivileged community because they don't have access to these resources. And we teamed up with um, AWS and we built Stanford Data Ocean on top of Amazon Web Services. And uh, it's a containerized platform and we'll talk about the architecture. And uh, with one click, our researchers would now can get access to the code and data. Everything is pre-configured. Uh, now uh, I would like to show you, yeah, so these are the, some of the modules that we created in 2021. Nine modules around all those uh, layers that we, uh, we mentioned. And uh, with one click, our users would get access to a virtual machine and everything is pre-configured and they could play with the uh, data and the code and you know, getting access to the Jupyter Notebook, R and Python are available. Another uh, tab is around data that the uh, researchers could now create uh, a, a real-time cohort by combining multiple data sets and we provide a virtual machine so they could play with the data sets. Now, uh, before I talk about education, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the architecture of the platform. And like any uh, major, uh, any, any cloud uh, solution, uh, we have two major clusters, you know, the front end cluster that is uh, handling uh, authentication, authorization, and, uh, uh, you know, AI, uh, VM and container lifecycle management. In the back end, we have the private subnet, of course, all those uh, private data sets and the containers and the, uh, virtual machines are running in the back end. And of course, around the whole system, we have uh, multiple monitoring systems that are helping us with uh, implementing uh, privacy and security guidelines. And uh, here's a little bit more information. We, these are the services that we use for the front end cluster. We have Amazon Cognito for authentication, uh, AWS S3 and Lambda is of course, you know, it's like all over the place, helping us with the microservice architecture and uh, uh, making this platform serverless. And then in the back end, there are amazing services for security, uh, including Amazon AWS Config, uh, or like, let's say, Amazon Macy, or Guard Duty, Guard Duty that they help us to uh, you know, deal with the security problems. 
A little bit more information about the platform. On the forefront, we are using AWS Cognito to uh, deal with authentication and authorization. And we are using AWS Certificate Manager for handling uh, secure, you know, providing secure connections. In the back end, uh, as I mentioned, Lambda is helping us a lot in terms of handling tasks, and uh, we're using Nginx uh, reverse proxy server running on ECS, helping us with respect to uh, mapping user session IDs to containers and virtual machines. And then in the back end, of course, everything is containerized. Uh, one of the services that uh, Sujai mentioned is, of course, uh, AWS Health Omics that's been very helpful. And uh, if you are not familiar with the field of bioinformatics, uh, in order to make a data set AI ready, you have to go through a multiple pre-processing steps. And it's typically it's very annoying for data scientists to go through that process. It's uh, really hard to configure that on these uh, uh, cloud providers. What Sujaya's team did, uh, they did a great job, and they created this uh, uh, service called Health Omics that they provide ready-to-run workflows. For example, for uh, genomics, we have a pipeline uh, called the haplotype caller that you get a big files coming out of the sequencing machine. FASTQ files, you have to process those, you know, and uh, align it with respect to the reference genome. It's a lot of work, and you don't want to do that. You want to get to the fun part, you get the variants, all the mutations, and do the annotation and the rest of it, but that process itself is really uh, time consuming, so they provided this ready to run workflows and uh, you know, a GATK haplotype called NVIDIA pipelines, Parabricks, and Deep Variant, and Sention. They're also providing private workflows, so you could you know, uh, customize these workflows and integrate it into uh, health omics, and they will orchestrate the whole pipeline and run it at a scale for you. So this has been very helpful in terms of like shorter training time and, of course, you know, reducing the uh, chance of errors on our platform. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is how we integrate it into our platform. So users would go ahead, bring their own bucket, specify the pipeline and the parameters. And uh, once they specify the parameters, they would just run it and uh, we will provide the VCF variant call format at the end. Now that I talk about the, the research side, I would like to talk about uh, a little bit about education. Uh, in our lab, we believe in order to deliver precision medicine, we should work on precision education. And uh, it's really important, to, uh, you know, personally, you know, I'm a computer scientist, I've had the privilege to work with one of the best geneticists, Dr. Snyder. We think that we should provide this chance to everyone around the globe. If they want to get this, you know, up, they should, if they are interested in uh, contributing to the field of medicine, they, then they should get the opportunity to do that. And, uh, so here's what we did. We uh, came up with this uh, network curriculum. And uh, if you look at the field of data-driven uh, uh, data, uh, medicine or bioinformatics, there are at least three major buckets. One bucket is around data that geneticists, physicians, and biologists are very good in that. One bucket is around tools that, uh, so talking about distribution, statistics, visualization, that the statisticians are very good in that. And one bucket is around technology that uh, we're talking about uh, cloud computing, mobile computing, scalability, and security that computer scientists, engineers are very good in that. So if you bundle it all together, then it's gonna be really overwhelming for people coming from different disciplines. So we came up with this uh, idea of network curriculum or integrated curriculum that uh, we start first with research ethics. It's a modular self-faced platform here that's integrated into DataOcean that it's all containerized. Our students start with research ethics. Uh, they will learn about how to respect data privacy, biases, uh, health disparity. And then at the end of this module, they are taking quizzes. Uh, and if they pass 80% of it correctly, then they would move on to the next level. Then we teach them Python and R and uh, Pandas. And if you're good in that, then you could just simply take a quiz and move on. It's self-paced. Then we talk about statistics, visualization, then a little bit cloud computing. And by the time they get to the cool part, which is you know, data and AI ML, they're ready. Now they could, you know, uh, uh, basically they have the fundamentals to uh, play with the data sets. And uh, we are very honored that we, uh, again, team up with Amazon Web Services because of their support. We have right now over 100. We recently launched this certificate program on our platform. We have over 150 underprivileged students that they're using this platform for free. If you're interested you know, to, use, uh, to get a certificate from genetics department, please uh, sign up, dataocean.stanford.edu. 
And uh, here's a little bit more information. This is a class that uh, Mike and I are teaching. Uh, and uh, we have students from CS, biology, and uh, also statistics department, pretty much uh, the different dis disciplines from different disciplines. And in 2021, we first offered these research modules. And uh, you can see here that uh, the students achieved their learning goals very well. It was okay, you know, but 2023, once we launched this new program, uh, we were able to shift this to extremely well. Uh, most of them uh, achieved their goals ex uh, you know, extremely well. And uh, finally, you know, you can't be in a conference and not talk about uh, generative AI and uh, large language models. So uh, we built an AI tutor on our platform that students could ask any questions about bioinformatics. Of course, we uh, uh, have a bunch of guardrails. Uh, but uh, this is like one of our large language models, is Cloud2, uh, running on Bedrock. And uh, students can ask any questions. And we're adding more you know, large language models and uh, uh, new uh, tools coming up, like a mentor, AI mentor, or AI uh, grader, and things like that are coming up. And uh, we're always looking for collaborators, like, you know, for instance, you know, we're teaming up with the Quantify team to work on this. So uh, yeah, that being said, uh, this was our presentation. And uh, Mike and I are going to be here in case you have questions or uh, you would like to. We, we're always looking for collaborators. So you know, in case you have questions, and uh, that's it. You know, I will hand it over to you, Sujan. Yeah. Thank you, um, Amir and Mike. I just wanted to um, say, please complete the the session survey. Uh, it's very important for us to get good feedback, positive, negative, whatever it may be. Uh, really, uh, and I wanted to thank both Mike and um, and Amir for being here and presenting with me. Um, we talked a lot about data, technology, you know, precision medicine, but in the end, I wanted to bring it back to the patient because that's what we're doing all this for. We want to improve health. We want to uh, cure these, uh, you know, devastating diseases. So uh, here's, uh, a, you know, a child uh, that was diagnosed with a brain, with a rare form of brain cancer, and uh, you know, she, this is this is who we're working for. So I just wanted to kind of bring it all back to the reason that uh, I'm sure many of us here have had, uh, you know, families and family and friends that have, you know, been affected by cancer, by other uh, diseases. I know I have, you know, family that, uh, you know, has uh, dealt with cancer and, 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 you know, gone through that. So this is really why we do it. So um, this is actually an example of uh, the, the, the slide I just showed was a child that was affected um, by brain cancer and, and the Children's Brain Tumor Network is somebody that we partner with. Uh, the, the coordinating center is at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but they, they have many, many uh, other collaborators. And so we, you know, we have these pins and I just took my uh, badge off, but I had the, uh, the pin uh, from there. So visit, please visit our Healthcare and Life Sciences Lounge. You can get a pin too. Uh, it's in the um, Venetian, uh, you know, in the Expo Hall, Hall B. And there's a lot more, uh, you know, information about all the uh, healthcare services and some really cool demos there. So, um, yeah, I would love to see you all there. And that's pretty much it. And, yeah, I think we're at time. So thank you so much for, yeah, thank uh, you. All of you for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you both. Thank you.